This is going to be continuing the series on the book of Job. And this is going to be titled, Meanwhile in Heaven. we just seen the introduction to Job and how he's perfect and upright. And we saw how the Lord has blessed him with children and, and with riches. And that's what's going on on the earth. You have a man that's perfect and upright, a man in the land of us. That's what's going on on the earth. But meanwhile in heaven, in Job 1, 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So the Lord is sitting on his throne up there in the third heaven. Satan and these sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord. And the first question that comes up is, was the devil not kicked out of heaven a long time ago? I believe the answer is that he was kicked out positionally, but not bodily. He got kicked out positionally back when he was the anointed cherub who was perfect in beauty. He lost his position as Lucifer, and now he is a has-been, and that's being kicked out positionally. He doesn't get kicked out bodily until the Great Tribulation. Revelation 12.10 says the accuser of our brethren is cast down, and that is possibly where he'll enter the Antichrist. It says in Revelation 12.10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Notice it says he accused them before our God day and night. I believe that is what's taking place in Job. Uh, the devil is up there looking to accuse someone. And God's going to say, Well, Satan, what about Job? I believe the devil still enters heaven to approach the Lord to get his permission slips. He has to have permission before he can attack anybody. And this story shows the superiority of the Almighty God over the devils. Revelation twenty one twenty seven talks about how there shall not enter anything that defileth into New Jerusalem, and that's yet future. Also, I don't believe the devil standing in front of the Lord with permission to get permission would defile the third heaven. It, it's hard to say how this scene is playing out, but by the context, it definitely looks like Satan and the sons of God are all right there in front of the Lord, and I believe the presence of the Lord in the context is right in front of him in the third heaven. I mean, I'm definitely open to correction on this, but the reason they, that I believe they are right there in his midst is because of verse 12. Look at Job 1, 12. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself, but not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So Satan left the presence of the Lord. If Satan was simply talking to God through his mind, and in some other location that isn't the third heaven, that was light years away, then I don't believe it would say he went from the pres forth from the presence of the Lord. Wherever he went, the Lord would be there because he is omnipresent. So if you picture the scene, I picture Satan and the sons of God standing before the throne. Now the next question is, who are the sons of God? Now, most men teach the sons of God are just saints of God in the Old Testament. And there are great men I look up to and admire that teach that. And if someone wants to teach that, I definitely don't see it as something to fight over or have contention over. At the same time, I feel obligated to say why I disagree with that. And even though I have went over this doctrine many times, if you're a regular listener, you may have heard it before. So since it's coming up verse by verse, we're just going to hit it again. The common interpretation is that the sons of God are simply just saved people. And that seems to be way off because of the context. As I just pointed out, the devil and sons of God are in the very presence of the Lord here. And if the sons of God are saved people in the Old Testament, then they wouldn't be standing in front of the Lord in the third heaven in the Old Testament. They would have been in paradise that was located in the heart of the earth at the time. 
remember the story of Abraham and Lazarus, and they're located in the heart of the earth in Luke 16. Whether or not you refer to it as Abraham's bosom or not, it doesn't matter. The fact is they are in, in the heart of the earth in a comfort side in Luke 16. And you can also see the rich man in a torment side in Luke 16. So the sons of God, I don't believe, are referring to safe people in Job chapter 1. And many times people will go to 1 John 3, 2, which says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Or John 1, 12, but it, which says, But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And they'll say, well, see, sons of God is just simply referring to safe people. Well, no one is denying that me and you as saved people are sons of God today when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke 3.38 it calls Adam the son of God. But remember, Adam did not have an earthly father. He was a direct creation from God. And when me and you get born again, we are a new creature. We get the image of God and become sons of God. But if you run to Job 38, 7, where sons of God shows up again, it's going to show you who the sons of God are when you see them in the Old Testament. In Job 38, 4 through 7, it says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? I believe these verses prove the sons of God were here during the creation of the earth. So therefore they could not be saints of God or the godly line of Seth. Man wasn't here at that time. And I heard a great man say that this can't be saying the sons of God are angels because the angels weren't here when God laid the foundation of the earth either. And he used a verse in Exodus to prove this. In Exodus 20 and verse 11 it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and Rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So they say, since God created everything in those six days, the angels couldn't have been here when God created the earth. However, I believe he's forgetting that there is more than one heaven. The heaven in Exodus 20 and verse 11 is not the third heaven, where God and his other beings are present. Exodus 20 and verse 11 would be referring to the heaven of Genesis 1-8. And that this is where God put the moon and the sun and the stars. So the angels would have been here in the presence of the Lord. So in Job 38-7 you have the sons of God present when God laid the foundations of the earth. That can't be Adam and Eve and we know it isn't some type of pre-Adamic race of humans. And you can't make cornerstone refer to the chief cornerstone which is Jesus. Because the context shows he's talking about creating the earth and not about Jesus Christ. If you make the cornerstone in Job 38 refer to Jesus Christ, then wouldn't it cause people to think that Jesus Christ is a created being that was created when God laid the foundations of the earth? That wouldn't make any sense to do that. And I also heard uh, the same man say that the sons of God were not shouting because of God creating the earth either. He teaches it's saved men or sons of God, shouting because of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. I believe that teaching is just taking the whole thing completely out of context. The sons of God in Job 1 and Job 38 are angels, are at the least something like them. And remember that not all angels stay good angels. These sons of God left their first estate, many of them, as it talks about in Jude, verses 6 through 7. They aren't the angels of God in heaven that neither marry nor are given in marriage in Matthew twenty-two thirty. They are the angels that left heaven and took them wives of all which they chose in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And they also use Hebrews 1, 5 to prove sons of God cannot be angels. Because Hebrews 1, 5 says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And they use that verse to say, you know, see, the sons of God can't be angels, because 
He never said to, in, to the angels, Thou art my son. But they forget one little detail in the verse. He, he never says to them, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. They leave out that, that little phrase, This day have I begotten thee. That's because angels aren't begotten sons. They're sons, but they're not begotten. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Even if the sons of God do not refer to angels, it still doesn't prove they refer to the saints. We may not know what is completely right, but we can know what is wrong. And for the reasons I've shown you, it would be hard for me to conclude that they are Old Testament saints. And if you would like to believe that the sons of God are saved people in the Old Testament, then you would have to believe that saved men went to the third heaven in the Old Testament instead of the heart of the earth. You must believe they made it there before the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed. You would have to believe men were here when God laid the foundation of the earth. You would have to believe that righteous men became born again sons of God in the Old Testament before the payment on the cross was even made. Just because the Lord knew that Jesus Christ was going to shed his blood on the cross for the sins of every man doesn't mean he applied that sacrifice to all the Old Testament saints. That wouldn't make any sense. If that is so, then what is the point of Job offering a burnt offering in this very chapter? What is the point of Job offering burnt offerings for the sins of his children? If God was giving all the Old Testament saints the benefits that me and you have as born-again believers in the New Testament with our sins washed in the blood of Jesus, then why is he offering a burnt offering for his sins and for the sins of his children. Wouldn't their sins already be covered by the blood of Jesus? What is the point of any of the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament period? But with, with that being said, so the scene in heaven is Satan and the sons of God, which are angels, presenting themselves before the Lord, accusing the brethren, and looking for a permission slip to go ruin somebody's life, mess up somebody's life. So Job is down there on the earth being perfect and upright, but meanwhile in heaven. You got something scary going on. Job 1, 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So Satan goes to and fro, kind of like the unclean bird in Genesis 8, 7 that didn't return to the ark. Remember the raven that went forth to and fro. And unclean birds picture unclean spirits. Remember in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That's what he's doing in Job. Job 1, 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. The Lord is like, so devil, you're in the accusing business, but what about my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Job? Notice God's op opinion of Job again. In the Lord's eyes, Job is his servant. He's perfect. He's upright. He fears God. He eschews evil. And there is none like him in the earth. Wouldn't it be something if that was the Lord's opinion of you. Well, in the sense of you being in Christ as a born-again believer, His opinion of you is even better than that. In the sense of your day-to-day -day walk in the flesh, you need to be trying to be like Job, perfect and upright, one that fears God and eschews evil. But in the sense of your standing in Christ, when God looks at you, He sees you better than He saw Job. But I guarantee you that the devil knew who Job was. I guarantee you he had considered him. And Luke twenty two thirty one 31 shows that Satan desired to have Peter to sift him. The evil spirits in Acts nineteen fifteen knew who Paul was. And I believe if you're serving God and following him, then the devils know who you are. And they would love to come down and mess your life up as much as they can. Job 1, 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Of course the accuser of the brethren would say something like this. Doth Job fear God for naught? Meaning, does he fear you for no reason? Hast thou made him an, made an hedge about him? 
and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. You see, the devil is saying that Job only fears and serves God because he's been blessed and protected so much. And the devil said the Lord has a hedge about him. And that's interesting because in Ecclesiastes 10.8 it says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Imagine if the Lord took that hedge away from you. The serpent would bite you, just like he does Job. The, the book of Job should make you so thankful and grateful that God has a hedge around you. And if he took away the hedge, then you would have all hell break loose on you. And that's what you deserve, really. But God's got a hedge around you. Job 1.10 has... Not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. The Lord blessed the work of his hands. Job was a working man. He was a manly man's man. Over and over again, you find in the Bible, God reminding you need, you need to work. In 1 Thessalonians 4.11, it says, And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. The greatest thing you can do is get up and go to work in some way. Even if you don't get paid. Just get up and work with your hands. Just like Job. He was a perfect and an upright man. Verse 11. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath. And he will curse thee to thy face. You see, Satan believes that if the Lord takes down the hedge and puts the leather to Job, that he'll just curse God and die. Never trust any predictions from, from the devil. Job 1.12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. You see, Satan had the power of death. Hebrews 2.14 shows us that. But he can only mess with Job's possessions and his flesh. That's all he got permission for. He can't kill him. Notice how the devil wants the Lord to put forth his hand on Job in verse 11 and afflict him. 